Hello, future friends. Welcome back. Tonight, uh, it's a Shanghai time. Tonight, it's a great honor for us to invite um, two very uh, important philosophers, uh, Bernard uh, uh, Stiegler from France, and also uh, Professor Lu Xinhua from Qing, uh, Tongji University. So it's, it's a great honor to have, have both of them here. Uh, this, the special background uh, is coronavirus. So the post coronavirus, uh, we organized to the, this, the 10th year of Digital Future event. So it's a great time. We have around 10,000 applicants. And finally, we have seven participants to this special event, uh, participate into 80, more than 80 workshops. In the past two or three days, we have a lot of panel discussion from all over the world, including Europe, including um, uh, China, including South America and America. So the um, expertise and architects and theorists, they um, gave us a lot different kind of thinking from different kind of perspective. So um, in the conversation with uh, um, uh, Bernard Stiegler and Lu Xinhua, I think um, the outlines of the concept focus on loca locality as a new strategy for how architects can work together. So that's the question we want to have today. So first, I would like to uh, briefly introduce the, uh, the two speakers today. Bernard Stiegler is a director of Department of Cultural Development at the George Pompidou Center in Paris. Also, he is a professor at the University of Technology of um, Compiègne, uh, where he is teaching philosophy. Because uh, uh, taking up the, the, the post at the Pompidou Center, he was a program director at the International College of Philosophy, deputy director general of the Institute National uh, uh, Audiovisual, then director general at the uh, Institute de uh, Roger at uh, co Coordination um, Music, IRCAM, Maybe uh, Professor Lu can introduce my more correctly. <laughs> professor uh, professor Sliegler has published numerous books and articles on philosophy, technology, and also digitalization, capitalism, custom uh, culture, etc. Among his writings, his three volumes of um, uh, the English translations, Techniques and Time, two volumes of um, um, Maybe Professor Lu Xinhua can introduce the, the books in, in, in English because mm -hmm. it's, it's in, 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 in France uh, later. And also uh, Stiegler is one of the founder of the political group Arts Industry um, based in Paris, which calls for an industrial uh, politics of spirit by exploring the possibilities of technology of spirit. To bring forth a new life of mind, he published ex Intensively on the problem of individual, individual, uh, individuation in customer uh, capitalism, and he is working on new possibility of economic of contribution. And last year, it's a great honor uh, uh, invited by uh, Lu Xinhua and me. And uh, Professor uh, Bernard gave a lecture in Tongji CAUP. I think it's a great, um, a profound um, uh, talking on the, the common ground of the, in the new um, uh, automatic society. And, and uh, we spend a long time and make a lot of readings, reference to my students, PhD student and grad student. I cannot hear anything. Have a problem with the sound. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, okay. And mm -hmm. briefly introduce Professor Lu. Uh, professor Lu Xinhua is a professor and PhD advisor um, at uh, the School of Humanities of Tongji University and School of Inter this Inter uh, Inter Medi uh, in Intermediate of uh, uh, China um, Academy of Art, mainly engaged in the research of contemporary French philosophy and the contemporary art theory. He many works including um, city philosophy and especially he make a re lot of research on Stiegler, uh, 
Stigler's uh, technological thoughts. I think uh, he is a very special researcher uh, on um, Bernard Stigler. So that's a great honor to invite both of them have a talk today. So first, uh, uh, firstly, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor um, um, uh, Bernard Stigler to make the speech. And then maybe Professor Lu, would you like to add something as a background introduction? <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you, Philip. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I think according to plan, I would uh, have uh, would raise a lot of questions to Bill and I. So it's not a lecture; it's about uh, a conversation. So uh, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, I am so happy to have uh, Bill and with us this evening. Uh, Bill and should have visited us this spring, but uh, there was the pandemic. So uh, this uh, Zoom meeting is some kind of uh, makeup for Bernard's Chinese followers. And I think, of course, this uh, is also a great honor for Bernard and me to be invited to this uh, event and to discuss with the young architects across the world. Um, uh, so um, uh, it's a big event for, for us and also for the university. So without further ado, let me start the conversation with Bernard, okay? So uh, first, uh, I would uh, raise a question about the uh, intergenerational issues during the pandemic, because I found it very difficult to face my parents who are in their 70s, and also my children. Uh, what should I say as a philosopher to them? It's difficult for me. Uh, if I tell them it's okay, it would uh, uh, be better um, how to convince myself to uh, <laughs> to do that. So uh, I, we know that uh, Bill and I have uh, altogether seven grandchildren. So I think, uh, I imagine that he must have phoned or talked with them at some moment, at a very uh, vulnerable moment of the pandemic. So uh, I would ask uh, Bill and I, uh, if it's possible, please tell us what did you tell your grandchildren? to like to be calm or that uh, to comfort them, to uh, make them feel safe. Uh, what you did say to them and what would you like to have said to them? Uh, thank you for your questions. First, thank you for your invitation. I'm very happy to, to have this opportunity to discuss with my friend Lu Xinghua and, and with all of you. Um, it's a difficult question, your, your question. I must tell you that uh, I decided to invite my grandchildren for holidays uh, in Corsica <laughs> next month, <laughs> in July, uh, mm -hmm. in order to, to reconnect and to discuss all of this, because during the confinement, uh, we, we didn't have the opportunity to have discussions. I discussed with their parents but uh, with them, I had connections by phone, but uh, the discussions were not about uh, the pandemic. It was about, for example, uh, music, because my youngest uh, grandchild, grandchild is a musician. He plays great And uh, we had uh, this kind of discussions. We didn't... Uh, talk uh, specifically about, about the pandemic. Now, I would say that young generations have to be mobilized and helped by older generations in order to fight against entropy, what I call entropy with an A and an H. I will explain that later. And this is, first of all, the question of revalue knowledge as it is structurally negantropic. And uh, uh, knowledge is structurally negantropic, but today it is destroyed by proletarianization, even by artificial intelligence, for example. And uh, during this confinement, the pandemic, and we organized um, some things with the young generation, particularly uh, with this young lady, she's a student, uh, in, in Paris, and uh, 
She is on this photo uh, participating to a demonstration on Les Champs Elysees in Paris. And she asks for the teaching of entropy in secondary schools and high schools. And uh, she also asks for uh, an economy based on this fight against entropy. So I think that today we have to re-articulate, rearrange the relationship between generations uh, for um, struggling against entropy and by sharing new forms of knowledge, by reactivating knowledge. Today, for example, in France, entropy is not uh, um, taught at school. And it is really a problem because if you don't address this question of entropy, you cannot understand, for example, why happened this pandemic that is the coronavirus. Because this uh, pandemic comes from, of, you, know, you know that, uh, it comes from what the IPCC calls uh, anthropogenic forces. That is a destruction of the equilibrium in between uh, living, diverse forms of living things and the human. So uh, we think that today we have to re um, uh, create confidence between generations. I, I guess that probably in China it's different, but in the West, in, in France, in America, in Europe in general, there is um, a loss of confidence between generations. And this is extremely dangerous um, because um, uh, what is uh, knowledge is what I call myself, what is transgenerational. And it is a condition of, of confidence. So, and, the, and confidence is also the condition of uh, economic uh, activity and the political life. So uh, I think, yes, the question of the relationship between generations is very ex extremely important. It is very di difficult to manage for me as a grandfather <laughs> and as a father, I try to. Uh, but I think that the most important thing is to organize social um, um, topics, social proposals, social uh, organizations. Uh, this is the reason for which I created uh, at the beginning of, the, of this year with my friend, uh, Jean-Marie Le Clésio, who teaches in uh, Nanjing University, and myself, I teach also in Nanjing University. We met in Nanjing and we became friends and we decided to create the, the association of the friends of the Thunberg generation. So uh, this is what I say also to my children, <laughs> to my grandchildren, you know. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, intergeneration is a very uh, important uh, uh, issue in many of your books. And I uh, remember that in one of your books, uh, the name is uh, Catastrophe of the Sensible. And you told us that uh, uh, we, uh, we even die in uh, uh, trans uh, inter inter uh, intergenerational relations because the grandfather would prepare uh, his own death around or for the uh, younger generation. For example, if the grandfather uh, wants to attract the grandson to back to the farm, to inherit the farm, to, to do his grandfather's work, he has to find some kind of, some kind of tra uh, uh, tricks to uh, make that happen. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's become more and more difficult for the older generation to uh, uh, attract the younger generation into their own courses. So it's really a uh, I think also a very uh, big issue for myself. Uh, considering yeah. that in China we have, we are always following the Confucius uh, tradition. Now, we, yeah. it's mm -hmm. all about the intergenerational uh, relations that uh, mm -hmm. the son, the daughter should follow the instructions from the uh, parents. But uh, nowadays, because we are also uh, entering a consumerist culture in China, so it's really a exactly. uh, disaster for me, I think. It's, uh, uh, so uh, I will leave this topic uh, behind. So next, I will try to uh, connect philosophy and architecture. Uh, in philosophy, we have Immanuel Kant, uh, who uses the concept 
uh, architectonics. It's a very uh, big word. It's um, about uh, macro architecture, I think. It's uh, about the, uh, how to, uh, how to uh, develop structures for the nation, for university, for democracy. So it's really a big name. But I think we have uh, uh, forgotten the, the, the significance of this word. And nowadays we have tectonics. That's a discipline taught in computer science, I think. So uh, I raise this topic because we need uh, some kind of uh, anchoring for contemporary architecture. So as a philosopher, I would uh, ask you to define uh, where is architecture today? Uh, do you think architecture is in the uh, genetic or algorithmic coding or in the stack, that is a future infrastructure uh, design, or in urban planning, as uh, we traditionally understand, or in the building of uh, software programming, or in the reconstruction of the deep structure for internet, uh, intonation, internet, sorry, for internet, or in the building of intonation, uh, which you and your followers spent a lot of time uh, in the last five years. So tell us, where do you think is contemporary architecture? It's a very good question, a difficult one too. Uh, let's say first that architecture means first drawing in advance a plan for a building and then a process of anticipation by an abstraction realized as what we call today a blueprint. I call such a document, the blueprint, a hypomnesic tertiary retention, which means uh, an artificial means for memorization. Probably uh, the first uh, architect, um, the, the, the practice of such tertiary retentions by architects was preceded by this uh, map, by this kind of map. This map uh, comes from Italy. Uh, it, is, it was produced um, in a cave during the Paleolithic period and it is considered to be the first geographic map. I don't know if it it's true, it's, uh, but generally archaeologists say that. Now, when Immanuel Kant, after Aristotle, talked about architectonics, because uh, the first one who talks about this was Aristotle, mm -hmm. the word came from a kind of metaphor of building. For example, Aristotle said, there is first meta, not metaphysics, but let's say philosophy. Under philosophy, there is uh, uh, geometry, under geometry, physics, etc. So it was a kind of uh, hierarchy and um, of construction of a hierarchy. Etym etymologically, now, architecture means in Greek, ordering techne and empiricity of the building workers. Now, architecture depends on the processes of what I call grammatization. By the word grammatization, I designate uh, the process of reproduction and discretization of movement and, and flux, like speech, for example, or um, uh, the movement of the manual worker that is grammatized by the machinery of the industrial revolution. And today, the work of the architect as it is grammatized by the building information modeling and process and, 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 uh, I, I don't know, and management. So I think um, now, Architecture is not only planning through drawings, 
but referring to knowledge like geometry and physics, it is the case for a long time from the beginning of, ar of architecture in a way. But now it is automatized with artificial intelligence, with databases, etc., etc., through, for example, the new industrial norm that is building information modeling. But all of this is conditioned by what consists in what I call hypomnesic tertiary retentions. The building information modeling, for example, is the new age of such hypomnesic tertiary retentions as they are automatized and completely computationable, calculable. In the 20th century, such a planning or programming became, as you said, an art in computer science. And some engineers in this field are called architects of information systems. The reference to coding comes from the convergence between architecture of buildings on the one side and softwares as they define architectural objects as coded data in databases. Today, with the building information modeling, and this is a, a, a video for promoting Autodesk uh, solution using the building information modeling. Today with this and with the internet of things, there is a large field of planning in which indeed, we can say that there is an enlargement of the notion of architecture. And probably the future will be based on a new architectonic explaining how we must hierarchize uh, the relationship, for example, in between um, genetic coding, uh, um, algorithmic coding, but also maybe law coding, political coding, economic coding, but I will talk about this later in the following dis in the, the discussion later. Right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, next I would uh, try to raise the question of the uh, uh, Heidegger's famous uh, theme of uh, the really inhabiting. So uh, uh, in the recent years, you have critiqued Heidegger for, uh, on many sides, uh, particularly on his understanding of techniques. Um, uh, that's, his uh, critique is already very popular, but uh, who says that his critique of uh, 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 techniques is not uh, good, is uh, very problematic. So uh, uh, next, I would you like to, uh, to like tell us on two sides, what you fi find the uh, uh, Heidegger's uh, concepts of techniques so problematic, that's the one. The other side is, uh, what uh, would you help us to uh, redefinition or to reinterpret Heidegger's concept of Dwelling, because if we understand techniques differently from Heidegger, it must be like a different uh, dwelling we are going to face up to. So, uh, can you summarize your recent critique of Heidegger on these two sides? Okay, I will try to. Um, uh, concerning techniques and technology, uh, it's it's a long and difficult question too because. The, I, I believe that Heidegger's position concerning this topic evolved in, in time. Now, myself, I tried to show in my first book, uh, The Fault of Epimetheus, that the basis of the problem is in Sein und Zeit, in the last uh, paragraphs of Sein und Zeit. When Heidegger says that maybe we should address the question of what he calls the Weltgeschichtlichkeit, this meaning antiquity, antiquaries, uh, um, objects testifying for the past, etc., cetera, et cetera, that is what I call myself tertiary retentions, that is uh, artificial memory, if you prefer. And Heidegger hesitates in between the paragraph 76, 77. And he says, maybe we should in, consider it as the originary uh, sphere of temporality. 
But at the end, he decides to exclude it from the originary temporality. Why? It is because he considers that techniques is always submitted to calculation. And he says that temporality is never calculated. It is always overcoming. It is always situated beyond calculation. Calculation, he calls that in the inside, besorgen. And he says that Zorge is never reducible to calculation. And I agree with him. But I claim that what I call tertiary retentions and what he calls Weltgeschichtlichkeit is never reducible itself to calculation. This is a question of what I call the pharmacon. And as you know, in the question concerning technology, that is uh, maybe 20 years after uh, Zion Tite, he says that technology is a kind of pharmacon. He doesn't use the word pharmacon, but he cites Hölderlin about the danger and saving. So he says, tech, uh, where is the danger is also uh, saving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I think that in this second time, that is the time of what he calls turning. The question of enframing, that is a question of, in, in German, gestern, appears, and it is much more complicated at this time than in Zeit und Zeit, and much more interesting. Gestern itself is a question of cybernetics and calculation for Heidegger as the process by which the biosphere, in the sense of Vladimir Vernadsky, becomes a technosphere. And for me, the difficulty with Heidegger is that he partly misunderstands the question of entropy and negentropy, as it is exposed, for example, here for the question of entropy and here for the question of negentropy. To dwell is to take care of the place you dwell. Now, considered from the perspective of life as Erwin Schrödinger defined it, and moreover of existence as the noetic and technical way of life, sparing and preserving, which is expressed and practiced by, as in, in German, Sorge, in English, caring, this always means fight against entropy. Here we must add that dwelling refers to housing, that is, home. And home means privacy, self, intimacy, etc. Houses are places in which appears the possibility of existence in the sense of Zionite. In other words, places for time as it is existential and not only physical. Homeless people, for example, are deprived from such an existence. A home, a house, is a microcosmos in a macrocosmos. Building can also deprive people from real possibility for existence. If it is true that a home is also located somewhere and that such a where that is also called uh, Ort by Heidegger and sometimes Lichtung constitutes a place for a city as it is a site of the police, as Heidegger says in this book. The police being a macrocosmos in the cosmos. The police makes possible the arrangement between the psychic individual and the processes of collective individuation in which it takes part. For such an arrangement, the tension between mortals and immortals 
gods in the sense of Heidegger is a tension between existence and spirits coming from what I call noetic necromas. I say noetic necromas in the sense in which Vladimir Vernadsky said that on earth you have the biosphere and the biosphere is based on what he calls the biomass. We are belonging to the biomass like trees, animals, virus, bacteria, etc., etc. And there is also what Vernadsky calls the necromass, that is humus. Now I believe myself that there is a noetic necromass. What is a noetic necromass? It is the accumulation of works under a form that is technical, that is constituting exactly what Heidegger called Weltgeschichtlichkeit. And the question is the ways to access such a noetic necromass. A school of architecture, for example, is a way in order to access to the noetic necromass in the field of architecture. A university is a way in order to access, for example, mathematics, philosophy, history, arts, etc., as the noetic necromass. So um, these institutions are institutions for cultivation, cultivation of this necromass, for making by this cultivation, new forms of noetic life appearing. And uh, this is a cultivation of what we call knowledge. And dwelling is a kind of knowledge. Now, to access to such a noetic necromass is always conditioned by technology and techniques. And here appears the question of technology as it transforms through infrastructures the dwelling at the level of the city and beyond the city of the country. This transformation, and now not only of the country, but of the technosphere, that is at the level of the biosphere. For example, the coronavirus and the pandemic are exactly uh, an expression of the becoming technospheric of this biosphere. This transformation by technology, which is based today on computational hypomnesic tertiary tension as algorithms, is an industrial exploitation of memory, which can destroy this noetic necromass, exactly like the exploitation of humus by industrial agriculture, sterilize this humus and engender desertification. Personally, I claim that such an arrangement between the psychic individual and the processes of collective individuation is always a kind of negotiation between entropy and negantropy. And such a negotiation is always a cultivation of knowledge and uh, the question of political economy as the articulation in between economics as such and the forms of cities, of countries, uh, they are not never based only on economics. Economics is based on calculation and dwelling is never reducible to calculation. This is a question that is open by Heidegger. But yes, I agree with you. I don't follow Heidegger in his analysis because of first the question of his misinterpretation of techniques and technology, the, the role of techniques and technology in the, in the, in the production of temporality, in the, in the originary temporality of existence, and because he is incapable to address the question of entropy and negentropy. He rejected these notions. Okay, thank you, Diana. Uh, it's great to, um, <clears throat> Uh, interpretation, uh, reinterpretation of uh, Heidegger's uh, concepts, and it's really uh, uh, very significant for me. Uh, so uh, uh, next, I would uh, pass into the uh, a very traditional topic for the architects. It's from Karl Marx. Uh, you uh, 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 talked about his um, 
uh, the theme of an um, architect and B uh, many times. And you said that uh, in, uh, in his co uh, cooperation with uh, Engels, the uh, German uh, ideology, uh, Marx got it right that uh, human labor is socially organized, that when it contributes to economy, it's uh, uh, mobilized a lot of uh, aspects uh, to, to, uh, to form uh, abstract labor. But in capital, Marx seems to relax from uh, uh, that kind of uh, thinking and become more conservative. In capital, Marx uh, told us that uh, uh, when uh, uh, B uh, built his uh, net, uh, he only like used his own organs, okay. but uh, if human architect built a house, uh, he use, uses his uh, ideas or uh, drawings or uh, designs. So you uh, uh, critique Marx on uh, uh, his, uh, his understanding of uh, technology when he uh, used this metaphor. So uh, I think it would be uh, um, very useful if you uh, further uh, explain this um, um, theme to the young architects because it tells everything about what architects should do in the Anthropocene. And I think it's a very good introduction to your uh, concept uh, used very often uh, recently, it's uh, exosomization. So uh, this metaphor would help us a lot to talk uh, further about the uh, what architect should do uh, for the uh, 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 what do you call the Negan uh, uh, scene. And uh, so uh, I hope you to uh, elaborate on uh, uh, summarize uh, your um, uh, discussions on this topic. Okay, thank you, thank you, Xinhua. Yes, this is a topic I developed a lot in, in Nanjing University during the previous years because I consider that we have to reinterpret Marxism uh, in a new way. I, I believe that today uh, people insist too much on Das Kapital. That is, of course, an extremely important book. But for me, it's not the most interesting one. <laughs> from the philosophical point of view in, in Marx's uh, work. I consider that, as you said, German ideology is the most important um, position of Marx when with Engels they claim that the point of departure of any kind of philosophy or economy is the fact that the human produces his organs, and those organs are artificial. This is a kind of continuation of, of discussion of Herder's, the German philosopher Herder's uh, thesis against which uh, Kant, Emmanuel Kant, wrote uh, 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 an article, a paper, for explaining that Herder was stupid when trying to find what himself he calls the transcendental conditions of knowledge into the feet of, of, uh, of the human. Because Herder said, maybe uh, this condition of knowledge is based on the transformation of the body of the monkey, of the ape, into the one of the biped, that is, uh, the human. And the making free the, the hands for making tools, etc., etc. Kant said this is completely stupid. And um, Marx, say, Marx and Engels say, no, it's not at all stupid. It is our point of departure. And this is a real question of economics and politics. So I consider that uh, Marx and Engels continue to develop that in the Communist Manifesto, even if they don't address the question directly in the Communist Manifesto, but it is their background, you know. And Marx continued that into the Grundrisse, the famous Grundrisse that are considered to be the manuscripts or the notes for Das Kapital. But uh, many, many of these notes were not used in the Kapital. And uh, I consider that it is really a shame. Why? 
It is because um, when he is asking the difference in this uh, chapter of Das Kapital in between the B and the architect, he says uh, that where the B has an instinctual, instinctual behavior when uh, building uh, his home, if we can say that, it's not a home precisely, the architect has the project and the anticipation of the building in the, in the head. Today we, sh we would say in the brain. And he is completely wrong. It is a regression compared with what is said precisely from German ideology to the Grundriss. Uh, in, during this time, he addressed the question of, that was this one, the question addressed by Ignaz Meyerson during the 20th century, when Meyerson said, knowledge is never in the brain, never in the head, it is in between people. It is a political and, and a social and a spatial organization of what he, call, he calls works. And when this book is, the title is uh, Psychological Functions and the Works, he says that the evolution of psychology, he, he, he uses psychology in the sense of, um, um, I don't remember his name now, I'm sorry, um, Vygotsky, you know, when Vygotsky gave these extremely important uh, courses on psychology during the 20s in USSR, uh, they say the same thing, that is, the psychological functions that are not only psychological, but noetic, uh, intellectual, uh, uh, the function of knowledge, if you prefer, are not in the brain or in the individual, but in the society, in the social. And this is produced by what he calls, Meyerson called that the works, but those works are what is de described by Marx as techniques, you know, as technological production. So I think uh, we have to go back to the first and the second uh, Marx on these questions. And um, it is also a question of politics and economics. Why? Because probably you remember that in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels said, uh, today the manual workers are becoming proletarians. And this process of proletarianization is a loss of knowledge because no, the knowledge is transformed into machines. This is a process of what I called previously grammatization of the gestures of workers. Now uh, they add that today this is proletarianizing the manual workers, but later it will proletarianize everybody, uh, engineers and even managers. Everybody will be proletarianized by this process of externalization of knowledge into, uh, for example, what we call today algorithms, artificial intelligence. And uh, here, uh, in the Grundrisse, uh, uh, Marx tries to show that it could be when everybody will have been proletarianized, the possibility and the opportunity to create new form of knowledge. Because the time making free with this process of automation, could make the, to, could give the possibility for everybody to cultivate new forms of knowledge. Now, uh, like Heidegger, Marx and Engels did not, didn't address the question of entropy and negentropy. Or more precisely, Engels said in the dialectic of nature that entropy is a, is a, is a false, a wrong theory of physics. And of course, he was wrong himself. So, so I believe that today we have to reinterpret all these works of Marx from the first and second period, but readdressing his questions with the, the, the theory of entropy and negentropy. And this is the reason for which I try myself to 
to address the question of what I call the Neg-Anthropocene, you know maybe that Heidegger and uh, Marx said, excuse me, Marx said that capital is destroying nature and we will have to overcome this destruction of nature. He was a, maybe one of the first ecologists, you know. Now I consider that today we have to overcome the Anthropocene, that is a destruction by what is called by uh, uh, as a moor, the capital scene, by producing what I call negatropocene. And for that, we need to, to struggle not only for entropy with an E, but for negantropy with an A and H. And what gives the possibility to produce negantropy, that is to struggle against anthropogenic forcings in the sense of IPCC, is negantropy in this sense with the N H. And negantropy is always produced produced by, um, by knowledge. So the question today is how to re-address uh, the question of uh, knowledge from the point of view of architecture. <laughs> this is for me our meeting. Uh. Yes, I think there are some problems with the sound. So uh, uh, let me summarize um, for uh, Vihana. Uh, uh, so as Marx said that uh, as a philosopher, we should not only interpret the world, but also change the world. But uh, if we talk about the situation of an architect uh, today, uh, they should not only change the world, uh, maybe the word, the word change is not uh, correct because uh, for me, like the architect is working in the technosphere as a uh, ticket as their building site. So uh, uh, their job is not to change the world, but to find the ways to, for us to like to live a better life in the technosphere. So it's really a much more uh, difficult uh, question. It's not about ideas. Uh, drawings and designs. It's about the uh, how to uh, find the uh, new ways, invent new uh, lifestyles to uh, to live properly in this uh, technosphere. To to act as a negantropic force <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, on this earth. So it's really uh, I think Vienna uh, has not developed enough to cover all uh, this uh, big issue. But uh, we have to leave it to the other questions. So uh, um, maybe we'll have time to do later. Uh, now next, I would uh, um, move to our main topic. It's about the, uh, the question why an architect should know his or her own locality. So uh, uh, Bruna, you should ask, tell us what is locality for you? And specifically, what is locality in your understanding for an architect? The question of locality is first, what is um, the condition of life according to, to Schrodinger? And I, I continue to believe that. And today, because now I, I work a lot with biologists and scientists about this question, for example, particularly with Giuseppe Longo and Mael Monteville, they are mathematicians and biologists. And they claim that, yes, we must follow Schrodinger, and I believe they are right, when he says that the definition of life is its capacity to economize, to struggle, to, to fight against entropy, but such uh, production of neg entropy or anti-entropy is always uh, local and temporal. Uh, it's at the level of the locality that you can organize uh, this uh, fight against entropy. So um, this is the first uh, question of locality. But if we follow another biologist and mathematician who died in uh, 1978, uh, not, excuse me, 1948, who the name is Alfred Lotka. I consider him to be extremely important. He said that exactly like, like Marx and Engels said, 
the human is constituted by his uh, artificial organs that are what he calls exosomatic organs or exosomatic evolution, not endosomatic, not biological, but organological, that is technological. In such a case, the problem is to produce negentropy and anti-entropy with uh, these exosomatic organs. And such a production of anti-entropy and negentropy is uh, much more complicated because uh, an artificial organ is always both entropic and neg entropic. For example, with a computer, you consume energy and you produce entropy. The question is, what will you do with this computer? Are you increasing the rate of entropy, not only in thermodynamics, but also in biology by the destruction, for example, of biodiversity, or in the field of information by destructing noises and, and, and knowledge? Or are you increasing the capacity for producing new forms of knowledge, new ways of life, new ways for dwelling, for example, capable to struggle against entropy. In the case of the exosomatic organs, the problem then is an arbitration that is called politics. And politics is a way in which you are optimizing the possibility of uh, exosomatic organization that is a city, for example, because a city, an, an urban fabric in general, is constituted by exosomatization, of course. But such a process is um, always um, um, a problem of uh, decision, of optimization, and of limitation of the bad side of entropy and increasing of the good side of neg entropy. This is a question of politics, but also the question of knowledge. We are what I call simple exorganisms. What I, why do I mean exorganism? We are not ex, we are not organisms like a dog, for example, or a flower. A flower or dog are organisms in the sense of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck and of Charles Darwin. But we are not organisms only, we are ex-organisms. If we are deprived of our tools, houses, etc., we can't live. This is what was said by Jean-Jacques Rousseau in The Origin of Inequality uh, in Humankind. So, um, our organs are exosomatized and our endosomatic organs, our brain, for example, our hands, everything are reconfigured by such an exosomatization. And this is what was showed by Marian Wolf, the, the American neuroscientist. Now, we always live with other simple exorganisms into complex exorganisms. What I call a complex exorganism is, for example, a fabric, for example, a factory, uh, not a fabric, excuse me, a factory, for example, a town, etc., etc. And in these complex exorganisms, we share with other simple exorganisms a, a, a place, you know, for working, for consuming, for sleeping, et cetera, et cetera, for uh, sailing uh, or, or buying. Now, there are two kinds of such complex exorganisms, those I call lower and those I call upper. In the upper one, a law reigns, and such a law is incalculable, and it is produced by the noises as it results from the dwelling of the inhabitants as they produce negentropy together. 
into the, what Simondon called the process of collective individuation. Today, it is possible to design cities with an instruction of the inhabitants, giving them the possibility of contributively dwell. This is the reason for which I'm um, myself interested in what is called building information modeling. That is for me a new urban revolution. And this urban revolution is giving two possibilities, is, is uh, producing two possibilities. One that is to increase entropy and proletarianization, and the other one to reinvent what is dwelling in a city, in uh, uh, an urban uh, milieu. So I would respond to uh, Vilnas uh, talking about locality by uh, pointing out that uh, for architects, I think they are using the different word, the urban fabric to replace the uh, concept of locality. So uh, after Vilnas talk, I think uh, I suggest they uh, should try to uh, unite or to uh, put the, the two concepts together. Uh, I checked the uh, concepts uh, before the uh, talk. Uh, for example, the Marxist uh, urban theorist, uh, Lefebvre, uh, defined it as the uh, ancient tombs, a mysterious rock, the gathering, the opening to the uh, cosmos. It's, he said it's from the countryside, but uh, when it's moved into the uh, city, people, people believe that's the, uh, like the, the source or the spiritual um, origin of the city, but actually it's the uh, human gathering in the countryside that uh, like found the uh, uh, urban fabric. So uh, I think maybe there are some kind of problems with the uh, use of this word in architectural world. I'm not sure. Uh, in Vilna's uh, vocabulary, it's the uh, uh, urban fabric should be the uh, localities on the organological not organic, uh, pharmacological and uh, exosomestic basis kind of uh, 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 location or uh, the uh, opening uh, place. So uh, I think we have already spent uh, more than 50 uh, minutes. So uh, this will be my last uh, question. And we have audience from many uh, uh, websites. So uh, uh, if you can please raise your questions and put them in the uh, a website. We will uh, um, ask people to collect the questions for them and we will answer them uh, later. So uh, this is my last question to Bihana. <clears throat> so uh, uh, you are talking a lot about the uh, uh, intonation and uh, how should we uh, go on with the course of the League of Nations. That's already more than 100 years uh, old. And it's about the international global union of people, at least of philosophers, maybe. But this year, where the uh, Digital Futures Program used a very uh, special uh, slogan. It's called Architects Unite. So <laughs> we invite you here to, uh, tonight. So uh, could you help us to like to uh, clarify the uh, significance of the global uh, unification or the union of architects, especially young architects. What cause do you believe they should fight for in the future? Why we should like to, 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 to do more of this kind of global union for architects? You know, our problem, our common problem on the world, in the world, in the biosphere, is entropy and the Anthropocene era. We must overcome this situation. We are now reaching the limits. And uh, those limits are really extremely dangerous. For example, I told you that myself yesterday I had here uh, 
35 degrees Celsius as a temperature. It's absolutely abnormal. So we have to completely change our view about what is development, what is urban planning, for example, et cetera, et cetera. And for that, we must uh, articulate precisely the questions we addressed previously with Heidegger. How to connect cybernetics dwelling and the future? Uh, I say cybernetics because you refer to Henri Lefebvre and he is very famous in China. I know because I gave myself a seminar on Henri Lefebvre in Nanjing. No, maybe it was in Hangzhou, I don't remember. Now, Henri Lefebvre rejected, exactly like Heidegger, even if he was not at all a Heideggerian, but a Marxist, he rejected the question of cybernetics. And he was really wrong. We consider in this collective, this um, group that is called the, the collective internation, we consider that we must reread Marcel Mauss, the French anthropologist, when he said at the beginning of the League of Nations that we should not um, erase the diversity of localities of nations. It is uh, a wealth. It is a possibility precisely of negantropy. He didn't use this word because this word was not coined at this time. It was in 1920 and the, the word was coined in 1944. But what he describes is for me, this question of uh, revaluation of uh, revaluating uh, negantropy and locality. Now, generally, this is the case with Heidegger, there is an opposition between uh, locality and technology, techniques, gestell, cybernetics, etc., etc. Myself, I consider that all to the contrary, the pharmacon is always producing new forms of, uh, it can produce new forms of locality. For example, this is what we try to explain here with architects, uh, urbanists, and many other people in this book that was just published last week in France. And um, this is also what we try to address as the question of building information modeling that comes from industry. This is here a boat, you know, a ship that is produced with a, the technology of building information modeling. And now these companies, as is Dassault that system, they want to produce cities with these technologies. Mm -hmm. And this produces this, that is a robot uh, replacing the manual workers, uh, the proletarians, because he works 20 times faster than a, a human. And uh, here uh, we can see that as a catastrophe, uh, of destruction of employment, for example, we, but we can also see that as a new way and a new uh, urban uh, uh, genius, you know, <laughs> uh, if we are capable to address the question with the young people. Here you see a, a classroom in which you have people using with these computers the video game mind test mind test is a free software version of what is called minecraft you probably know minecraft that is a video game extremely famous in the use everywhere in the world and what do we do with that we work with them and architects why because we believe that first this is what you can do with mind tests you know and uh, this is a representation of a part of the, of the suburbs of Paris. And uh, we are now launching a program with them where we are into four years, making them capable to um, address the question of the future of the city, the urban planning, etc. It is a context of the Olympic games, you know, because it's in the suburbs of Paris. Uh, in the north of Paris, and this is a place where you will have the Olympic Games in uh, 2024. And we are organizing uh, their work and, and their teaching around this program with this video game and the building information modeling, but also geographic 
databases, and uh, uh, geographic uh, information systems, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in order to make them to become relevant for making proposals and new organizations of the districts, for example, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, new relations in between the public uh, institutions and, and the private life and the economic life, et cetera, et cetera. I will not develop that, but one part that is important is that uh, they also work in order to use clay, uh, crude clay, uh, for producing new types of, of buildings and with the new types of companions of, of workers using robots for producing these buildings and inventing a new way, much more negantropic for building. So it, I, I say that very fast, very, very quickly because uh, uh, we don't have time, but if you are interested in this, I can give you many informations on the website. I think it is a reinvention of the role of the architect. Today, the architect must work with the inhabitants not only with those who are giving the orders for building, for example, those investors in, in uh, construction, in, in building. Uh, it is important to create new communities and new local, urban localities with people uh, sharing a common project. And it is possible to make this. Why? Because between video games, building information modeling, smart cities, etc. The question is always the same. It is grammatization. And how you can use grammatization as a pharmacon with which you can increase entropy and proletarianization and stupidity. But exactly the contrary, on the contrary, you can develop the common knowledge, uh, uh, the economy, the, what we call economy of contribution, etc. Et that is based on the process of deproletarianization and invention of new, new ways of working based on new knowledge. So I, I, I was obliged to go very fast. So I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, now I can answer your questions. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot, Elvin. I, I really uh, appreciate your contribution to uh, this pro uh, project, and I enjoyed very much the uh, uh, the conversation. So, <laughs> so uh, before I uh, put my uh, <coughs> uh, uh, control back to uh, Philip, I would uh, summarize your message uh, in these two uh, slides. First, you told us that we must reinvent architecture among younger generations. Secondly, told us that uh, we should, uh, uh, when we're doing architecture in the uh, city, we have to find the urban locality for people, not only for the architects. So uh, it's really a, a very uh, clear message. And uh, I hope the architects in the audience uh, will join us in the uh, conversation. So uh, 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 in the following, we will open up to the uh, questions. And I hope uh, Philip would uh, help us uh, collect the questions. So I would uh, choose some of them first. Now, the quest uh, one question is from Yang Guang. Uh, may I ask in what sense is the coronavirus a kind of entropic forces, as Mr. Stigler describes it? So, uh, Bilna, is uh, coronavirus a, f a kind of entropic forces. Yeah. You know that this problem of uh, this pandemic is the loss of uh, uh, immune defenses by people. Uh, the problem with the virus is that the virus needs to find a new host, you know for a reason uh, because cannot develop in the normal host uh, that is generally an animal. Uh, it, needs, it needs to, to move towards a new kind of host. Generally, uh, this uh, migration of the virus is limited because of the of um, immune resistance 
of the immune system of the human kind. Now, in the case, first, we, you, you must know that from the, uh, uh, after the Second World War, there was an increase, uh, a very strong increasing of the development of new forms of infections by viruses and, vi and bacteria. Someone published in the Institut Pasteur uh, last week in France a comparison of the curve of uh, the acceleration of consumption after by the exportation of the American way of life, first in Europe and then everywhere in the world, even in China now, and with consumption of cars, uh, everything, television, etc. And the curb of, uh, um, uh, intoxic of, of pandemics after the Second World War, the acceleration is exactly the same. Now you must know probably that uh, since 1997, a new form of, of viruses appeared in China. Not only in China, mainly in Asia, but particularly in China. And these new forms were always accelerating their transformations because a virus is always transforming its ARN, you know. So um, this acceleration is considered to be produced by the fact that uh, the anthropization of geographic country, uh, of, of, of countries that were white countries previously for example, with the deforestation, with the production of palm oil, et cetera, et cetera, are creating new contacts between uh, human and animals, but also with the, the acceleration of, uh, of commerce, of uh, globalization. There is also an acceleration of the migration of the virus through goods, through commodities, et cetera, et cetera, through industrial production. So uh, today, there is a consensus everywhere in the world for claiming that this pandemic, for example, was very dangerous, not because of the virus in itself, it is not so dangerous. But what is extremely dangerous is the acceleration of its uh, circulation, but also the decreasing of immune resistance of the humans. Why? because of a standardization of food. For example, today in China, you eat sugar, you consume milk, etc. Et it was not the case 20 years ago or 30 years ago. In Amazonia, in America, in Europe, you had many, many kinds of systems of food and of cooking, of agriculture. And this was producing a diversity of what is called the micro, um, uh, I don't know the word in, in English. Uh, let's say, uh, we call that in French, microtop. That this is the bacteria as you have your, in your intestines, you know, and that are producing and specifying your immune defenses. And the diversity of these immune defenses is extremely important for protecting uh, humankind. Today, this diversity is destroyed. What I call here diversity is what is called by Schrodinger locality. So it is a uh, question of changing industrial economy into uh, not a process, of, uh, only a process of standardization, but as a, in the process of adopting standard, standards for producing diversity. And this is uh, where the, the role of artists and, uh, and thinkers. And uh, an architect is both an artist and a thinker. So I think this is the reason for which we need to create new groups with biologists, mathematicians, physicists, architects, doctors, philosophers, etc., for organizing a new immunity, a new um, uh, political economy based on the process of immunization. But this is not 
the question of closing the borders, you know, because this is what is said today by Donald Trump. But uh, the question is not at all to close the borders. It is to open the borders, but to open them in an egantropic way. So for making circulating not viruses, but knowledge, for organizing uh, exchange between countries, nations, etc., etc., based on noises. This was, you know, the discourse of um, Albert, uh, Alfred Einstein when he said we should organize a scientific international. He said uh, this against the Nazis when they wanted to create a, a German science against the other, et cetera, et cetera. So we are revisiting, re uh, discovering the question of the beginning of the 20th century, but in the field, in the, in the frame, in the context of the Anthropocene, uh, of the Anthropocene. At this time, at the beginning of the 20th century, nobody had any idea about the question of, of pollution, of uh, um, entropy, etc., etc. So today we are confronted with this, with almost 8 billions of people on Earth, and we have 10 years in order to change the situation. So uh, yes, uh, this is, a, for me, the stakes. These are the stakes of uh, the, the experience of pandemics. Okay, so, thanks a lot, uh, Birna. I would uh, uh, like to add it, uh, to a uh, little bit. Uh, I read your recent uh, interviews, and uh, you talked about the uh, precarity on the global, uh, global scale. So the, audi the audience uh, tries to uh, ask you the, uh, uh, whether the uh, coronavirus is um, an entropic force. So uh, I think that there, are, uh, there are two levels. Uh, globally, it's really uh, very uh, dangerous and put everyone in a very precarious uh, position. But if we talk about the locality, as you have told us that if we, uh, we start our defense from the locality, it, that will be the, like, the strategy. So uh, uh, I would like to point out the, uh, um, the strategies from the uh, local side. Now, we know that the, uh, the industry, the, uh, um, uh, the platforms are, are fabricating. Uh, for me, it's like the precarity is not the, uh, uh, the natural uh, uh, consequences. It's the uh, result of the, the fabrication of, uh, I would say, the uh, calculative industry. So uh, the more they uh, produce this kind of like the consumerist culture and the, the, uh, our behaviors, so that will contribute to the uh, precarity on the global uh, scale. But the hope is on the other side, because we can live uh, locally like an artist, uh, that we can find our own way of uh, invent new ways of living. So uh, um, if we want to really to fight against the uh, virus, I think it's not on the industrial side. It should be on our own side. It's, uh, it will depend on our own invention, our own, uh, uh, maybe own collective efforts. It's kind of uh, um, our efforts put into the building of the locality. Of course, it will be new, but uh, the virus is kind of a pushing force for us to start doing that. Yeah. Yes, of course. But for me, there is no opposition between locality, individual or small communities, initiatives and industry. I believe that we have to invent a new kind of industry that is uh, managing the possibility of localization of, of such production of local wealth, for example. And um, uh, the question is behind, you, you refer to the platforms of calculation. The most important are American and Chinese. Mm -hmm. These platforms uh, must be completely reinvented and uh, changed into a new kind of what I call uh, 
theoretical uh, computer science. All our system today is based on what is called Turing machine. Uh, we are now, for example, using uh, Zoom, uh, plat the platform Zoom, that is Facebook, and uh, we use it through computers. Myself, I use a MacBook Air that is produced in China, and I don't know which uh, brand you, <laughs> is yours, are yours, but uh, they are called co uh, Turing machines. Mm -hmm. And these Turing machines are considered to be able to solve any question through algorithms and computation. I'm launching a new group, in an, an in international one, uh, with people from everywhere, even China, particularly through UQE, that is a group of computer scientists, mathematicians, etc. Et and we say that a computer is not a Turing machine, and that a computer is dangerous because a computer is not addressing the question of locality. And we must change the architecture of uh, computer science, of computers, of computer machines, of, comp of machines of calculation. We must introduce entropy and negentropy into the functions of the computers as a problem that must be um, uh, not solved, but decided by people, not by algorithms. Because when you replace everything by algorithms, you are destroying the possibility of, ent of negentropy. This was demonstrated mathematically by Ludwig von Bertalonfi, but also it was demonstrated anew through social networks in the, in the University of Virginia four years ago by a mathematician, the name is John Fultz. So uh, we consider that we have to reinvent computer science in order to make it capable to, to, valorize, to value um, negentropy, diversity, localities, etc., and to give the possibility in between localities to create networks, not for erasing diversity, but all exactly on the contrary, to increase the, the, the wealth of this diversity. So um, it's, there is no opposition between industry and, uh, for example, uh, philosophical work or, or artistic work. You can do uh, uh, anything today as a philosopher, for example, or as an architect by using these technologies. And we are doing this now with this uh, Zoom communication. And after that, you will you will be obliged to work with building information modeling, even if you don't like it, because it is a new dynamic. So the question is not to resist against uh, these technologies, is to modify them and to modify the use and the practice of these technologies. Why? For modifying the social relationship, the social uh, dynamics. And uh, this is the reason for which I said it's a question of political economy and also of libidinal economy. Thank you, Vivna. Uh, so I would uh, contact uh, Philip. Uh, Philip, could you uh, collect questions for us from the uh, Bilibili and uh, YouTube? Mm. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, yeah. Hello. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, uh, lecture and talks between um, Professor um, Ziegler and uh, Professor Lu. I think it's extremely interesting. Uh, from an architect's perspective, I think uh, it's a great uh, comments from Stiegler to what we're doing on this platform. It's a, because uh, right now the digital future is this new kind of uh, knowledge platform. We'll, we'll try to reorganize the the way is how to teaching and how to learning, actually. Uh, more than 80 workshops is actually the instructors is not only a professor, but also some PhD student and some researchers. It's kind of a democracy to reorganize the, the, the new knowledge and how to spreading, how to learning. So I think it's a kind of um, feedback to the, the talks. I think uh, we are doing something which is uh, really 
put forward a kind of new uh, knowledge system, a new um, platform contribute to the new knowledge system. So the new knowledge is coming so fast. I think uh, the invention of the new system of learning is a kind of a natural um, entropy process mm -hmm. in, in architectural discipline. So that is the first feedback from myself. And then we have several questions. Maybe it just I just select um, two or three and asking to, uh, to speak, uh, Bernard. So the first thing about the, uh, the architecture, so because we are architects. <laughs> so uh, you are talking about the, the locality, which is uh, to architects means more to the, the sustainable uh, process to make the cultural um, uh, things more sustainable, uh, which is a renovation or we try to find some uh, new possibilities to keep not only the economics growing, but also can keep the culture, um, culture uh, which could be like a sustainable to the uh, to the to the uh, built environment. So I mean, the question goes to uh, what do you mean the locality, the concept of, of locality and the negative entropy process. If there are any. Uh, 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 relevant relationship between this kind of cultural aspects to the economic growing, how to balance or how to integrate this kind of cultural thing and economic growing things. Because the paradox is coming, for example, in China, in the local area, a lot of empty village, empty village, because all the young generation, they, they're, they're looking forward to earn more money. They're moving from the small town to the big city. So it's kind of leaving their hometown and uh, the fabric of the rural area in China uh, compared to the high, high density, high rise um, city like Shanghai is quite a big country, uh, uh, paradox. It's quite different. The young generation, they don't like to live in the countryside. That's a paradox to the, uh, the, the phenomenon in China. So the question goes to how to invent certain kind of new system new knowledge system or new, new, new social system to attract the young generation going back to the rural area and how to set up kind of new ways to attract people back and uh, to make uh, even more economic growing uh, inside the rural area. So is that a kind of negative entropy process? Uh, so it's, it seems not um, uh, very, it's a little bit neg negative because um, the process of urbanization is still gro growing in China. So uh, do you mean the, uh, the Niagara uh, entropy process uh, in Anthropocene uh, should invent some new, um, and invent some new social or economic um, uh, process to, uh, to, 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 to doing some diverse um, process compared to the urbanization. So that's the first question. Uh, I don't know if you okay. <laughs> understand what I'm talking about. Uh, thank you. First, I will, I will answer you what you said yourself about education. Um, yeah. Because this is, this is a very, very important question. And myself, I am now launching a new initiative in France towards the mm -hmm. uh, Ministry of Education in order to... to to launch what I call contributive research, associating um, students, teachers, uh, researchers, scientists, and artists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to reinvent um, the institutions of education, because after three months of confinement here, of lockdown in France and uh, during this time probably it was the same in China people were obliged to to teach through this platform zoom we are using now and the parents were also obliged to to to, to study to help their their children to study at home etc etc this created a very important uh, reflection, deliberation, thinking of, about what is to educate. And it is also in the context of the crisis of education, a crisis that is also a crisis uh, 
that was also evoked by uh, Xinhua uh, about uh, the conflict in between generations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and yourself, you address the question uh, from the problem of uh, those young people who want to to move to the, the cities, to the to urban milieus, and to leave rural milieus. Um, I think that we have to completely redefine what we call knowledge. Um, for me, knowledge is not only what is taught in, in, uh, uh, in universities and high schools, etc., and institutions. It is also um, the everyday life knowledge, hospitality, for example, and all of these uh, cooking all that is so important in China and so good in China. This is really something extremely important to protect in China. That is the diversity of cooking and the knowledge of cooking. Now, all of this is destroyed by consumption, by con consumerism. And um, it is a case because of the question of uh, industrial economy, because for a, bi a businessman, industrial economy is first of all um, economy of scales. And uh, what is called economy of scales is uh, in this context based on the destruction of diversity, the standardization. You know. uh, I consider that this is what we have to change and that it is possible to change it. And for that we need what we call a con um, an economy of contribution that is based on the valuation of knowledge, of uh, knowledge of the manual worker, that is how to do, the knowledge of the, the inhabitant that is um, dwelling precisely in the sense of Heidegger, and that is dwelling in community with the with, with the neighborhood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is completely destroyed today, not only by TV and, and, and supermarkets, etc., but also now by social networking. Now, I consider myself, I'm launching, I'm specifying with industrials in France, a new kind of social networking that is localized. It is capable to, to, to connect with other social localized networks, but the rules of participating of participation in such social networks are completely different from what is the case on uh, Snapchat or or uh, Facebook, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because we are addressing the question of negantropy first and second. There are many, many uh, limitations of the algorithms for avoiding the algorithms to decide for yourself and or for the group. The idea being exactly on the contrary, to evaluate uh, the, the local groups in order to make them developing what is called collective intelligence. You know. So um, I think that in such a view, it is possible to overcome the opposition not the difference, of course, but the opposition between the countryside and the urban uh, side. Um, it's also um, a question, in, a very interesting question to see that you probably know that Detroit, the city of, of cars, of uh, Ford and, and General Motors, that is now a, a phantom uh, town, is transformed into uh, a new kind of uh, urban agriculture that is based on permaculture, etc. So that's very, very impressive. You have many, many people who are now producing vegetables, etc., etc., in these ancient factories. I say that why? Because I think that something is happening extremely fast, and that is completely changing the what we consider to be the in the movable functions of industry etc., and, and, and differentiation, the opposition, for example, in, in between industrial and craft uh, 
skills, etc. etc. This is completely changing also through the Fab Labs and those new uh, uh, means of production. And behind all of this, the real question for me is to change accountability. To change accountability because the real point of departure of uh, industrial economy is not only the machinery, it is accountability. This is the reason for which Max Weber was right when he said that capitalism starts with accountability. That is writing the debts and the credits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and sharing uh, the process of uh, um, through coins, through uh, um, I don't remember the name in English. I'm sorry, currencies uh, to to learn how to count because a French historian showed that uh, learning uh, counting started not with schools, but with the use of currencies, of, of coins, you know. Now, uh, I say that because the basis of capitalism and market economy is, is, is uh, currencies, and, the, and these currencies, these, uh, this uh, money, let's say, is producing a process of accountability. Now, this accountability today is based on the valuation of entropy. The more you produce entropy, the more you win money. And this is what we have to change. Today, what we are um, developing in the north of Paris is an economy of contribution in which the accountability is based on struggling and, or fighting against entropy. And we completely change the, the economic indicators. And today we are uh, engaging big companies like Danone, that is one of the most important company in the uh, agro-industry. Uh, uh, Société Générale, that is the most important bank in France, etc. Et because they see that the development of the current economy based on entropy accountability is finished. It is irrational. It is destroying everything. So they are moving towards this. And I think here you don't have oppositions between countryside and, and town, for example. Now, uh, if we want to develop that, we have to redevelop new kinds of infrastructures new kinds of networks, new institutions for, for producing knowledge, sharing knowledge, invention, etc. And we have also to practice what we call contributive research, mm -hmm. in which we make people uh, who are, for example, a PhD candidates or postdoc candidates, we give them money under the condition they work with inhabitants on the locality for solving uh, or studying uh, precise questions and problems identified by the population and, uh, and with uh, cooperation with companies, with administrations, etc., etc. So uh, we are living today this uh, complete mutation of industrial development. Maybe we will, we will not be able to, to change this uh, quickly. And uh, in such a case, we will have much more difficult problems than the pandemic we, we knew during the last year, because we are creating the conditions for an explosion of such problems. So the, the question is, I hope Donald Trump will not be elected in, the, in two months or three months. <laughs> and that we will have Joe Biden, not because I don't believe that Joe Biden is very interesting, but Trump is silly and his <laughs> conflict against China is extremely dangerous because it, he makes China itself in a reaction against such an aggressivity and this blocks the possibility to evolve and to change this situation. Now, if Biden appears, probably Myself, I will launch a movement from obliging America and China to discuss in a new 
in a new um, style, let's say, and about these questions, because I think it is uh, a, the condition for the future, you know, this discussion. And I would like, of course, to convince European Union to, to participate to these discussions. Yeah, great. I think uh, another very interesting topic um, Professor Lu put forward is the, the main topic of digital future this year, Architects United. Uh, I think um, um, Bernard um, make a really interesting analyze uh, through the new form of locality should uh, base on the, the new um, knowledge such as uh, robotics, uh, BIM, or redesign the city, even though like some video game is kind of very well reorganized or updated version uh, of the infrastructure system uh, to provide a certain kind of uh, new organization uh, which can um, 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 uh, uh, do something, uh, nagger um, uh, entropy, give new contribution advantage to the, the real in, um, uh, growing um, forces which compete with some uh, capital driven entropy, right? I think um, the most interesting thing, what we are doing actually right now is um, very similar to what um, Bernard mentioned. We're making some research on the robotic as a new um, kind of uh, uh, infrastructure system which can not only based on that platform can help not only to build in the, the macro city, but uh, we especially focus on the, uh, on the uh, rural area. If this kind of a new um, um, infrastructure system could um, increase the, the new industry uh, for this kind of uh, customized uh, small scale uh, village house, I think it's kind of uh, something, give the quick feedback to the architects unite. Maybe uh, after coronavirus, the new creation, new economic growing need to be find to make uh, more laborers or more um, uh, architects. They can find some more bottom up ways to make driven the, the economic growth, maybe not just by the capital investment from the super big company and uh, from the uh, the capital games that's already played in the last 20 years in China, I think uh, probably um, out of stream right now because it's really difficult to organize such kind of uh, mass production under the pressure of the uh, uh, pandemic um, uh, spreading. So everything like uh, shock stopped, uh, but uh, it's time, it's great time for us to organize this um, discussion organize a special uh, digital future um, uh, discussion to rethinking on what kind of a new um, system or new forces can help us to find some new engine to driven the, the, the uh, to, to be the forces to driven the, the future uh, growing. I think uh, economic should be still growing, otherwise uh, it would be disaster. But I totally agree with Bernard talking about uh, it should be a smart uh, new intelligence. The new intelligence is kind of a, a infrastructure system. And uh, the data maybe could be layered, set, set up by the layers to give new um, um, uh, delegate uh, uh, process or the, the advantage of new um, opportunities to the young generation, to the rural area people. And uh, that probably could be a new chances for us to, to do. I think it's great. Um, I, I, I can uh, got a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, information from this lecture, from this talking. I think uh, 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 some architects on the website is asking, asking the same question I would like to put forward to Bernard because you use a word Romanization to architects. You are at the, at the very beginning of the lecture talking about the architects is doing some romanization process uh, to the city to the architecture. So, could you give us some analyze on this word? What do you mean the romanization to architects? So, 
uh, at least uh, three, three architects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They ask him this question. The word, yeah, the, the word is grammatization, no? Yeah, grammatization. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I, what I call grammatization comes from the work of a French uh, historian and philosopher of linguistics. The name is Sylvain Oru. Uh, he talks about uh, the conditions of the appearance of grammata, that is alphabetic writing, um, three million years ago. Um, in uh, around in uh, Mediterranean, around Greece and uh, and uh, this region of the camp of the of the, of the West, and uh, he, he tried to show that this process of grammatization, that is of the appearance of ta grammata in Greek, the letters in in English. Uh, could appear. And he said, generally, people thought that these grammata were invented by grammarians or logicians. And he showed that it is exactly the contrary. The grammata, the alphabetic writing, appeared uh, exactly like a process of a technical invention that is, nobody, know, nobody is really uh, um, willing to produce that. It is produced uh, with no conscience and uh, it appears uh, through a transformation that takes, let's say, six centuries between uh, Mesopotamia and Greece and by a process of transformation that is not conscious. And those who are living this are not aware about this. If I, if I precise this is because I consider the question is techniques here. The process of grammatization is a dimension of the evolution of techniques and precisely of those specific techniques and technologies that are what I call hypomnesic tertiary retentions. That is, that are these technologies of memory, of the process of externalization and, and transmission of memory from uh, generations to generations. You know, of course, that um, these, the basis of civilizations are uh, the appearance of such hypomnesic tertiary tensions like in China, in Egypt, in South America too, in Africa too, and uh, because we don't know now those were destroyed, but there were also other forms of writing in, for example, South America with uh, Incas, etc. And this process for me of grammatization is not only the one of speech. And in China, it is not at all the one of speech because Chinese writing at the beginning is not uh, writing of, of, of language as such, but it is another kind of writing that is still a mystery for, for Westerners and the fascinating reality that was, you know probably that, one of the most important inspiration of uh, Leibniz, uh, the German philosopher, Gottlieb Leibniz, who created what he called the Characteristica universali, that was the first theory of coding as it was concretized by mechanography and then in, uh, and computer science. Well, I say that because the process of grammatization for me starts um, during the Upper Paleolithic in the caves when the humankind is capable not only of producing new weapons, for example, Flintstone tools, but uh, or, uh, many other uh, kind of uh, lithic uh, uh, weapons, lithic uh, exosomatized uh, organs. But when grammatization starts, when the humankind is capable to exteriorize or externalize his memory and his dreams 
his uh, representations, you can see in the prehistoric caves what was seen or imagined by the human, prehistorian human, for 40,000 years ago, you know, for example. Uh, I was told two months ago that um, now uh, a new cave was discovered in Australia that is 70,000 years old and in which you have uh, paintings, sculptures, etc. This is for me the beginning of grammatization. Mm -hmm. And I consider that such a grammatization is always defined by many, many um, aspects, but two most important aspects. The first being reproduction. Mm -hmm. You can, during this upper Paleolithic period, reproduce the imagination or the vision of, of the viewing of, of, the, of those people of this time. But you can also produce a discretization. That is a list of forms, uh, a list of, of objects that will be, for example, in the case of uh, uh, Chinese uh, ideographic writing, 30,000 characters, if I am well informed. In the case of alphabetic writing, 26 characters that are not characters by grammata, precisely in Greek. But this is the beginning of a process that will be changed for example, with the printing press, and then with the appearance of reproduction of sound through the phonograph, transmission of sound through the phone, uh, telephone, reproduction of the visible through the photograph, etc. etc. This is the stake of the work by Walter Benjamin on photography and cinema, reproduction of movement with cinema, with television, etc. And today with computers. All these technologies are for me technologies of grammatization. Now, in architecture, it is extremely important because uh, you have, with the appearance of drawings and conventional drawings, conventional that is with definitions of conventions of representation, like in geography and cartography, you know, you have a process of grammatization of the objects of architecture. In the West, Vitruve is, is the most important historian of architecture who describes this process of categorization of the parts of architecture. Uh, today, for me, the building information modeling and management is a new age of grammatization of architecture. The question that were, that were addressed by uh, Lu Xinghua concerning dwelling with Heidegger is, for me, not for Heidegger, but for me, this is the question of how is it possible to make this new process of grammatization changing not only the industry of building, the ways of design by architects uh, of, of buildings, but the ways of dwelling in the sense of Heidegger. And I believe that it is possible, not only because it's good, but it is because it is absolutely necessary. If we don't do that, we will not be able to produce sustainable buildings, sustainable cities, and we will destroy our milieu. So it is, for me, you know, I am a rationalist, so I believe that it is necessity that makes the future. It's also freedom. The possibility you have the freedom to choose the best or the worst, you know. <laughs> and uh, this is what is said by Arnold Toynbee at the beginning of uh, a famous book, I don't remember the title in English, where he tries to describe what is the process of civilization. He talks a lot about China. He knows a, lot, a little bit China. And um, uh, for example, what is very specific in China is that the beginning of China is based on another process of grammatization. The first course I gave in Nanjing University, it was six years ago, 
was dedicated to uh, Chinese geometry and uh, um, Greek geometry. And I tried to show that, uh, you know, that Joseph Needham, the, uh, the English uh, historian and anthropologist and uh, also scientist, was a specialist of China and wrote a book about this question, uh, differences in between Chinese geometry and, and Greek geometry. I think that uh, the stake of the difference is uh, the difference in between grammatization. And that it is an, a very, very important question. Um, now we have a process of unification of these grammatization, these kinds of grammatizations because of the globalization. But um, um, the question is now how to practice these globalized processes of grammatization for producing diversity. And here, I don't know the Chinese history, so I'm not capable to see that in Chinese history. But in um, European history, you can see, for example, you can show that when the Athenians, it was in uh, 406 years before Christus, uh, decided to oblige all the great Greece to adopt one alphabet because previously they had very diverse forms of alphabet. Uh, it was a process of standardization. But this process of standardization produced an incredible diversity because all those people from Athens, Ionia, Sparta, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the colonies everywhere in, in Europe they created. Having the same alphabet, they could exchange and create very, very different uses of this alphabet, very different forms of literature, of philosophy, of science, of history, of laws, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I think that today this is the stake, how to practice grammatization in a way that makes possible um, a new process of diversification that is of localization. Yeah, that's a fabulous uh, analyzation. I think we need time to understand and to make more research on the grammatization. I think it's a great um, words, uh, which including not only the technology um, aspects of um, the urbanization or the, 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 the social process, but also including the, uh, the memory as a kind of um, uh, poetic uh, drawing uh, process, how to um, uh, implement uh, grammatization to fulfill this kind of dream, and also including the reproduction of the social industrialization um, platform or process based on this. So it's profound um, kind of um, categories of uh, uh, infrastructure to understand the uh, um, um, how to make not only the object, but also something behind it. But I have one quest, quick question, feedback to the uh, globalization and the localization. So right now it's like uh, the physical human behavior is localized because of the post-pandemic, um, give us a lot of limitation for moving. So the, the real human behavior actually is uh, in a very strong limitation for you going outside, for you to real communicate with your friends. But at the same time, I find that quite a globalization process by information because we make like this kind of Zoom learning platform uh, which link us totally globalized. So it's, it's a kind of paradox which um, uh, like separates the physical body, um, uh, the physical um, subject with our mental subject. So it's uh, like the mental subject uh, sub subjectivity is like a, quite a kind of a connection globally, uh, even 
uh, profound and even uh, easier to make connection globally. But uh, our body actually is limited in the local uh, environment, a local area, local space. So how would you like to analyze this kind of paradox can give what kind of future do you think uh, uh, this kind of separation will give us new opportunity or to, to face what kind of encounter, what kind of future uh, which can give us? So I have a quick question on that. Uh, it's a difficult question, this one too. Um, myself, I consider that if we want to address the question of the body, we must um, um, consider the question of what I called previously uh, complex exorganisms. Our body is always uh, um, um, augmented um, um, with supplements like uh, visible supplements like this pen, for example, or my headphones, etc., etc., but also invisible supplements that are interiorized by education. If I can use this pen, it is because I know how to write, you know, and to read. So uh, this is. Uh, the reason for which I say we are exorganisms, simple exorganisms, but as exorganisms, we are always implied into what I call complex exorganism with which we create another body, a bigger one. Uh, for example, a factory is kind of body. This is what was said by Marx in the Grundrisse, referring to Andrew Ewer in his philosophy of manufacture. And um, this is also what is uh, studied, for example, by Henri Bergson in his book, uh, The Two Sources of Moral and Morality and Religion. I say that because I, I, I think that if what I said previously, that is, we must reevaluate. Uh, locality that is negantropy. In such a case, the stake is to reconstitute a social body and to make possible this process of globalization, of uh, deterioration, etc., etc., through, for example, Zoom, exactly like what we are doing now. Uh, you are in Shanghai, I'm in Paris, not in Paris, but in, in France. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we can uh, cooperate through this technology. That is a tele-technology, as Derrida said. But what I could tell you, it is because I created myself many bodies. Ars Industrialis, the association of, of uh, 500 people working together, cooperating for thinking economy, contributive economy, contributive research, etc. Et I work with architects in France. I work with many, I, may, I create, a, I participate to social bodies. And my body, my, my, my uh, own um, body is, uh, of course, um, uh, present in these, in these groups, you know. These groups were for three months uh, uh, stopped and uh, transformed into Zoom communities. But for 10 days, we are a new meeting in Paris in the Institute of for Research and Innovation and in uh, these uh, schools, high schools, uh, secondary schools, et cetera, et cetera, with these students, with these teachers. And it is extremely important because you cannot do everything on Zoom. So what I say is if we want to really develop new forms of, a of, of fight against 
uh, entropy, we must develop new form, new forms of social bodies of, of local communities. So the, the body is not disappearing. It is reorganized socially. It has to be reorganized socially through a new organization of political economy and of economics itself, of industrial economy. So this is a very important stake for the architects. Uh, precisely, uh, if you read, we just published in French a book that we prepared with 60 people, even someone like Richard Sennett, for example, who, who works a lot about what is uh, the new city, what is your new urbanity. And we wrote this book with 25 people. And the, the, the title is Bifurcate. It is in French, but it will be in English very soon on Open Humanities Publishing online and by book. This is, it is the same publisher like the Negantropocene I published uh, two years ago. And uh, I say that because there is a chapter dedicated to this question. There is a chapter on the new urbanism, and uh, it is a chapter three, I believe, and uh, that is in, um, describing particularly the transformation of morphogenesis of cities. If you study the history of the morphogenesis of cities and urban fabrics, it's, you have very, very specific and characteristic uh, times and, and types of organizations. For example, Paul Virilio in France showed how the railway station completely transformed the process of urbanization uh, during the 19th century in France with factories. And uh, today we are living what I called uh, previously the new urban revolution. It is something that is completely re-articulating uh, this morphogenesis of cities with platforms, with global platforms that are themselves based on what I call the exospheric circle, not on Earth, not into the biosphere, but around Earth with satellites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Today, we have to completely reorganize the process of social bodies of what I call then these uh, complex exorganisms. And this is the stake of our discussion. That I will have to stop, I'm sorry, because first I thought it was at noon our meeting, and, uh, and I, I have uh, now a, a meeting uh, with somebody <laughs> else. So okay, I'm really Thank sorry because <laughs> I didn't read correctly the, 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 the email Early by hour. <laughs> By Xinhua, and I, I, say, I saw at noon, and I was uh, waiting for at noon. <laughs> but now I have something else to see. You know, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you, you so are, much. Thank you so much. Meeting anymore? Yes, we know that. Uh, thank you so so much, uh, Bernard. It's really uh, um, very enjoyable uh, evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was my pleasure. It's great. It's and great. I hope we'll meet great next time. year in China. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So thank you so much, Stegen. Yeah. You're welcome. My bye pleasure. Bye bye. Yeah.